I want to let you know that the adult study we've been having on Wednesday nights is about, we're about finished. It's been over the invisible creation, and so it's all the, all the weird things in the Bible, the angels and demons. We've spent some time talking about the devil this past couple of weeks, and uh, it's been a great study. It's really helped open our eyes to what the Bible says about God's spiritual creation. And uh, we're going to end it this week. Uh, it helps us also, uh, I've, I have felt that it's helped us to understand what our purpose is as Christians. It's been difficult at a lot of levels uh, because the ideas and the characters that are involved in God's invisible creation aren't talked about much at church for whatever reason. But uh, it is, even though it's been difficult, it's been good. So that it'll end this Wednesday, but then the following Wednesday, we're going to start something much less difficult and something much more essential. Many people, maybe this is your story, many people have expressed faith in Jesus, they've been baptized, and then they've just been left alone by the church to figure out the rest. Maybe, has that been your, your story? Were you, you, you saved and, and put your faith in Jesus, and then you were baptized, and the church just said, wonderful, and sort of let you figure it out. That, that seems to be a, a normal thing for most people. Um, maybe you've been invited to join a Sunday school class, but Sunday school class isn't really meant to help new and young believers with their big questions. And so on November 15th, which is the Wednesday after next, uh, our adults are going to go through a discipleship book that's written by the Navigators. It's called Growing in Christ. And we're going to go through this together for a couple of different reasons. The first reason is to give those of us who've never been through a discipleship pathway or a discipleship journey together to go through one and to grow in it. Uh, then the other reason is to give us the structure of how to lead someone else through it for a disciple to make another disciple. This will be a training time as much as it will be a, a growing time. Um, discipleship is going to be a big focus for us in the coming year, and I'm really looking forward to uh, going through this book together beginning on November 15th. I hope you can join us for family night. It's on Wednesdays. We have midweek worship that starts at 6, and we have something for all ages. So we're going to continue, though, in 1 Timothy, our gospel-centered godliness sermon series, Being the Church in the Community. This morning we're going to be in chapter 6, verses 1 and 2 this morning. And as we study through this letter, I'm attempting to keep our focus on the godliness, on the call to godliness that's clearly stated throughout this letter. The call to godliness is a reoccurring theme in 1 Timothy. It's mentioned at least 10 times, and we're seeing that this call to godliness for Timothy for church pastors and for church members, is for the sake of the gospel. It's a call to the church and its leaderships to live and worship in a way that proclaims the gospel to the church, that is, each other, and to the community. And it's, it's important to note, I've been saying this each week, it's important to note that this is always in response to our salvation. Godliness is never a cause of our salvation. You and I we cannot work our way to God. That's not the gospel. We are only saved by grace, through faith. We are, however, saved to do good works, to live a godly lifestyle, and to share the hope that we have with others. Look with me at 1 Timothy chapter 6, verses 1 and 2. Let all who are under a yoke of bondservant, as bondservants regard their own masters as worthy of all honor, so that the name of God and the teaching may not be reviled. Those who have believing masters must not be disrespectful on the ground they are brothers. Rather, they must serve all the better, since those who benefit by their good service are believers and beloved. Let's pray in response to what we just read. God, thank you for your word to us this morning. Thank you for this call to godliness. Lord, I pray that as we look a little closer into what you're saying to us in these two verses, Lord, you would have our minds think of our workplaces, those we interact with during the weekday. 
and that the gospel is meant for there too. God, we thank you for Jesus. It's in his name we pray. Amen. So this morning we're going to look at the subject of godliness at work for the sake of the gospel. This is the best reading of the passage for us today, but as we look at what Scripture is saying to us, we must understand that it is not speaking of work the way you and I understand work in our context. We are dealing with an ancient book that speaks to us today, but it speaks with practices of the days that it was written in. Case in point, this morning we looked at verse 1, and my ESV says, and we read the word, bond servants. Do we have any bond servants here in Allen County today? We might have had some in the past, but, but probably not so much today. And what's more is if you're reading this in the New Living Translation, you saw the word slaves instead of bond servants. And when we think of slaves, we probably have the awfulness of the American slavery system that comes to mind. I was in a meeting last month where I heard that there is growing pressure in some areas of the country to preach the Bible without the word slaves because of the awfulness of the American slavery system. The Bible was written well before the sins of America, before their slavery, and the biblical context isn't the American slavery system. In Greek, there's only one word here that, that is used, and it's douloi. In the ESV, this word is translated three different ways. It's translated as slaves, bondservants, and servants. In Romans 6.6, 6, it is translated enslaved, relating to our bondage to sin. Here in 1 Timothy, it's translated to bondservant because it alludes to a working relationship instead of a bondage type of relationship. And in uh, the Gospel of John, chapter 4, verse 51, the word is translated to servant because there seems to be some type of freedom that this servant has in the passage there in John. Understanding the context and the meaning of the words in the Bible is important. We are not bondservants of sin. We are slaves to sin before Christ. We don't serve sin. Before Christ, we are held in bondage by sin or to sin. If those who want to rephrase the Bible because of the sins of America come this way, hold fast to your Bible. Don't ever let popular modern ideas shape the way that we read or reread our Bible. This passage today is really quite interesting because it introduces a new social system in the early church that people didn't have to address before the gospel. I have this quote from the Bible Knowledge Commentary. It's going to be up on the slide behind me. Take a look at it. Under normal circumstances, slaves and masters had no associations outside the institution of slavery. With the advent of the gospel, however, these two groups found themselves thrown together in the congregation in new ways, creating problems the apostles were forced to address repeatedly. This is so cool. The world sets up institutions, it sets up practices, and the gospel penetrates them. The gospel tears them down. Because of the truthfulness of the gospel, a bondservant and a master stand on equal ground. They worship together the same God in the same church. And what happens during the rest of the week will help establish the culture of that church. Before the gospel... Bond servants and masters didn't have to relate on any other level except for that working agreement. Then Jesus shows up. The gospel is proclaimed. It is for all people. It penetrates into the community. This is new. This is a new thing. The New Testament writers have to deal with this. The book of Philemon is mostly dealing with this topic. Every church in the Bible is having to deal with with this. Here's what Paul writes in 1 Corinthians. Each one should remain in the condition in which he was called. Were you a bondservant when called? Do not be concerned about it. But if you can gain your freedom, avail yourself of the opportunity. 
For he who was called in the Lord as a bondservant is a freed man of the Lord. Likewise, he who was free when called is a bondservant of Christ. You were bought with a price. Do not become bondservants of men. So, brothers, in whatever condition each was called, let let him remain with God. When you come to Christ, your situation in life might, might not change drastically. Paul is saying to the church here in Corinth, if you were a bondservant when you became a Christian, don't automatically assume that your freedom from the hold that sin has on you translates into freedom in your working condition. Today, we are looking at this passage with our ideas of work and career, and it still speaks to us. Just realize that the original audience had a different understanding of what it meant to be a bondservant. This was a person who would work and save to buy his freedom. The way that we understand retirement might be a little bit helpful. You work for someone with the hope of entering into the freedom of retirement one day. It's not a complete picture, but it might be a helpful one for some. Let's look again at verse 1. Let all who are under a yoke as bondservants regard their masters as worthy of all honor, so the name of God and the teaching may not be reviled. Now, do you remember where Timothy is, what church Timothy is serving at, what city is associated with Timothy? Ephesus. Here's what Paul wrote to the church in Ephesus. Bondservants, obey your earthly masters with fear and trembling, with a sincere heart as you would Christ, not by the way of eye service, as people pleasers, but as bondservants of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart rendering service with a good will as to the Lord and not to man, knowing that whatever good anyone does, this he will receive back from the Lord, whether he is a bondservant or is free. Masters, do the same to them and stop your threatening, knowing that he who is both their master and yours is in heaven and that there is no partiality with him. The issue of bondservants and masters being in the same church wasn't just an Ephesian problem. It was an all-church-everywhere type of problem. And Paul and other writers of the New Testament wrote on how Christians who have a working relationship outside of the church should relate to each other because of the gospel. Here is what Paul wrote to the Colossians. This is Colossians 3, 22 through 4, 1. Bondservants, obey in everything those who are your earthly masters, not by way of eye service as people pleasers, but with sincerity of heart, fearing the Lord. Whatever you do, work heartily as for the Lord and not for men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the inheritance as your reward. You are serving the Lord Christ, for the wrongdoer will be paid back for the wrong he has done, and there is no partiality. Masters, treat your bondservants justly and fairly, knowing that you also have a master in heaven. It almost sounds like the same thing, doesn't it? It's the same guy who wrote this. Paul wrote this to two different churches because the gospel was creating this new social situation that the early church had to deal with, and it didn't know. It's amazing to see the gospel at work here in the Bible. It's amazing to see the gospel here at work today. It was wonderful to see Jocelyn get baptized this morning. It was great seeing Rob express his faith last week, and I look forward to his baptism soon. The gospel matters. The gospel is at work, and when you go to work for the adult or to school for the student, don't leave the gospel in this building. When you go to work or school in the morning, the gospel goes with you. Do you realize that? The gospel goes with you. What you do at work and what you do at school affects your proclamation of the gospel to those around you. What you do at work or school affects the way people will listen to you as you share of the hope that you have in Jesus. In your notes, work at your job like you're working for Jesus. Work at your job like you're working for Jesus. Christian students, you should be the hardest working students at school. Learn and study like Jesus is your principal. 
If you work at your job like you're working for Jesus, don't you think the gospel would be accepted better by your coworkers? If you work at your job just enough to get your paycheck, does that help the witness you have about living under the authority of God? Christians are saved by Jesus. We live under His authority of, as God. And if we work just hard enough to get by, we are showing others that we don't think much of Jesus. In your notes, treat your boss like you're working for Jesus. Now, your boss isn't God. I was waiting for someone to say amen about their boss, but they might be in the room. But your boss isn't God. He or she didn't die on the cross to rescue you from your sin. Jesus did. He is God, and he has given everything to you, including your job, your work, and your boss. Treat your boss like you're working for Jesus, especially if your boss is a believer. This is in verse 2. Look at verse 2 with me. Those who have believing masters must not be disrespectful on the ground that they are brothers. Rather, they must serve all the better since those who benefit by their good service are believers and beloved. Paul is saying, serve God with all your heart at work. And if your boss is a believer, serve a little bit more. Now, I don't know how this works. It's like giving 110%. But I think what Paul is saying here is that your work matters. What you do at work is a reflection on how you see God and Jesus. As a Christian, how you work at your job speaks on your view of God and His authority and His redeeming work in your life. Make sure you work hard, but even more if your boss is a Christian. Why? You know, it's because Christian managers benefit from hard-working Christian staff. Christian managers benefit from hardworking Christian staff. I've been in management for several years in a few different careers in a couple different states, and I can tell you, hardworking staff members committed to their work and to the organization are a blessing. Over the years, I've seen Christian staff be some of the most devoted to their work and to the organization. I've also seen Christian staff be some of the, la the laziest and least devoted to their work and organization. As a manager, I noticed that their work was a reflection of their faith. Be devoted to your work. Be devoted to your organization for the sake of the gospel. Now, Paul isn't only speaking to workers when he writes to the churches. He usually speaks to the masters when he addresses this topic. Jesus is also focused on the ways that those who have authority treat those who are under their authority. Look at Mark chapter 10 with me. As Jesus called to him and said to them, you know that those who are considered rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their great ones exercise authority over them. But it shall not be so among you. But whoever would be great among you must be your servant. And whoever would be first among you must be slave of all. For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. What do we see here? Christian staff benefit from gospel-centered Christian managers. Christian staff benefit from gospel-centered Christian managers. Gospel-centered Christian managers serve their staff like Jesus served others. This is a wonderful picture of the gospel. This goes for those, for those who work and for those of you all who are in school. The student-teacher relationship is very similar to the employee-manager relationship. The gospel is at work and at school, and the way you interact with each other shows how you believe the gospel. As a way of response to this passage this morning, I would like to lead us through a couple of minutes of prayer together. You have some prayer prompts in your bulletin, and I'm going to open us up in prayer in just a moment, and then would you quietly pray for, for there in your seat? And I realize that some of us 
are managers and employees. Some of us are retired. If you're retired, um, pray for your kids or grandkids who may not be retired. And, um, and let's, I'll open us up. We'll have a, a, just a minute or two of quiet prayer. The prayer prompts are there in your bulletin, in your notes. But for the employee, you can pray uh, for yourself. As a student, pray for yourself um, in those ways. Let's, let's, let's open in prayer. Let me open in prayer. God, we thank you for our vocation, for the job that we have. For those of us who are, who are working, Lord, we, we thank you for the work that you've laid out before us. Lord, I pray that, that we would see our work as a place that the gospel is proclaimed. Strengthen us to work if, as if we're working for you, as if you are our supervisor, because Scripture tells us that you are our supervisor. You are our, the one that we are ultimately accountable to. Lord, help us to see that. And for those of us who are in management, Lord, I pray that we would see those who report to us, especially the believers, as precious working for you, not for us. Take a moment and pray for yourself quietly. God, we thank you again for the work you've placed before us, the careers that we report to, the classes that we have. Lord, it's my prayer that, that those of us who call White Plains home would be the hardest working, most devoted students in this community as a reflection of how we see you at work in our lives in response to the good you've done for us, Lord, that we would respond to that by working hard, by studying hard so that the message of the gospel can go forward unhindered. So thank you for this, this church, these people. Lord, strengthen them tomorrow as they go to school and to work, as they face a week ahead of them. Lord, let them see their workplace is a place the gospel goes with them. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. It has been my hope and my prayer this morning that you see your workplace as a place the gospel goes. And it's proclaimed in the manner that you work, the way you treat your boss, the way you um, treat teachers, employees, and students. The gospel matters. And it's at work, at work. The gospel matters. It's at work, at school. Perhaps you realize that you don't give your work the effort that the gospel demands. Maybe you're just doing enough to get your paycheck. Would you confess that to God this morning and ask him to strengthen your spirit and give you a better outlook on the work that you have in front of you for the sake of the gospel? For those of us who are supervisors, maybe you're not treating employees as equal under Christ. That's true at work, everyone's not equal in rank or status or responsibility. But at the cross and under Christ, we are equal. Maybe you see them as working for you rather than working for Jesus. Would you confess that to God this morning and ask Him to give you a gospel outlook in the way you interact and serve those who report to you? I'll invite the worship team to come on back up. And throughout this series, we've I've brought your attention to Romans 6.23. For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Without Jesus, you die. Not just a physical death, 
That's a death we all do. But you will be separated from all that is good and loving for a future forever. That's the death that sin brings. Death and separation from God and goodness. But God gives you grace and the free gift of Jesus. In Jesus, you have life, even after your death in this world. Life everlasting awaits those who make Jesus Lord and the center of their life. Will you follow Jesus today? Will you submit to his authority over your life and at work? We're going to sing in a moment a song of invitation. If you want to talk more about what it means to follow Jesus or how to live your life like you're a Christian, this is a time for you to come forward and pray or speak to me. Are you following Jesus? Does your life look like it at work or at school? Will you stand as we pray? God, we thank you again for this time together in your word. As we think about our work in school, Lord, I pray that we would, again, see that as a place the gospel can be proclaimed. Help us to live in a way, a godly way, that helps people to see the hope that we have. Thank you for Jesus. In his name we pray. Amen.